Hello, my dear ones. Whew. We are approaching the end of summer, such as it was here in the islands of Scotland. Um, we have one more week of pilgrimage left before us. And then, by the grace of God, immediately after the Dormition Feast is over, and we celebrate the Dormition of the Mother of God, we shall go on pilgrimage to Moldavia, our annual pilgrimage to those beautiful painted monasteries in Romania, the northeast of Romania. We go there every year, and it is half pilgrimage, half a period for all of us here at the monastery on Mal and the monastery on Iona to recover a little bit. You know, with all these videos that uh, the monastery produces and our pilgrimages in the summer and um, all the videos and the messages and the prayer requests and uh, the correspondence really that goes on in our online community because that online community doesn't just have our monthly Zoom meetings and our weekly videos and it has also ways to request for prayer and to ask private questions or questions for other people. Um, the weekly updates from the monastery, it's got its own little universe. It, it created actually this beautiful little universe where you're always constantly in touch with everyone who's, who's part of the online community. But when you've done that for a full year, and especially so when you've done that for the four months of summer, every interaction I have with one of you, be that by email or in person during our pilgrimages or, you know, in our direct interactions by, by Zoom for our online communities, every interaction takes you somewhere else from, from yourself. You, you have to, if you want to actually be part of the life of the person who's asking for your prayers or a question of you, you have to travel with them. You have to leave this central axis, which is your own being, and somehow travel with them in whatever direction the, their own lives have taken them. So you, you're sad with the people who are sad and you are genuinely taken by their sadness and you rejoice genuinely so with the people who rejoice and, and you enter their lives and then, and then you go. You go into your lives and I'm no longer grounded in myself. I'm no longer centered in myself because every single email reply, every single pilgrim who has shared a conversation with me, um, we normally go out into the evening and we take a walk one on one. And that's when, when people open up and they, they pour things onto myself. And I'm, I'm grateful and I'm honored and I'm in awe every time that happens because there's nothing more intimate and nothing more building in, in an eternal way than to share oneself with another and to be open to receive whatever God gives you through the mouth and the heart of the other. I'm honored, grateful to God, grateful to you for every single meeting of that sort because that is a real meeting. A real meeting is not just about having a cup of tea together and exchanging niceties about the weather. A real meeting is a sacrament where you pour something of yourself in me and in responding to you, I give something of myself to you. But at the end of a summer of doing that, you feel ungrounded anymore, like you've lost your, your axis, your center. Every time I approach a topic that comes from an, a question of yours, I have to move myself, move my, my heart and my mind into, into your worry, into your topic, into your problem. And today, probably because I am tired, <laughs> today I just wanted to share with you something of myself, rather than me answering a question that comes from you, 
I want to share something of myself with you so that hopefully at the end of this video you will have to carry me with you into your own lives rather than me being left here with your worries and your questions and everything else. As we approach the end of yet another year because the end of the summer for us is pretty much the end of the year. After this we enter our den. We, we enter our burrow. Winter will come with its beautiful fog and rain and darkness and, and the silence and the solitude and the quietness and the little things that we'll end up doing, making more pots in our pottery studio, praying more, having more time in the night to be awake without the worry that you have to wake up in the morning, doing more services, all the things that have carried me into a monastery become once again fully available in these beautiful six, seven months of winter. And that's good because they feed us, they nourish us, so that when summer comes again, by the grace of God, we have something to give you. Like our bees, we, we gather our nectar, our pollen, in the winter, we're like some strange bees. We gather all the goodness in the winter and then we are out in the summer dispersing, by the grace of God, some sort of honey to, to all of you. As we approach this end of yet another summer, yet another year, all I crave to do is to see my spiritual father. Nothing else. All I crave for is to, to see him and to... When I was a kid, my dad would sometimes <laughs> um, <clears throat> lift me up on his shoulders and carry me around. I had my legs over his shoulders and he would hold on to my hands here and um, sometimes I would just hold on to, for dear life around his head. And he would just run about with me and pretend that he was a horse. And I had the greatest fun of, of my childhood. And it felt so safe. And I felt so loved. And I felt I could completely abandon myself in that safety and that love. As a grown-up, as an adult, I only have that when I when I find my way on my spiritual father's back, when I, when I just climb on his back with everything that I am, with all the horrors of my sin and everything that I've gathered in, in a bad way during the last month or the last year since I've seen him last, and I allow him to carry me forward. And both as a spiritual son and as a spiritual father to other people, I, I know the value of that abandonment. I know the value of a spiritual child who climbs on your shoulders and abandons himself or herself to your care so that you can take them in the direction that God is showing you for them. That full abandonment, that full obedience, that full trust makes it possible and makes it easy for me as a spiritual father to carry them forward. It is when they struggle, they still climb, on top of my shoulders, on my back, because that's the way of the spiritual life. You cannot move forward by yourself. That's self-delusion. That's nothing but demonic pride masquerading as spiritual virtue and ability. No one, no one can be saved alone. No one, with no exception can be saved alone. When you carry someone on your shoulders, but that person still wants to go a certain way, 
or still wants for the path to look a certain way, to feel a certain way, to have a certain experience. When you have someone, when you have a kid even, on your, on your shoulders, on your back, and they continue to, to, to wrestle and to fight and to want to get off, but then they realize that if they go down, there are dogs down there and they are afraid of them, so they crawl back up. And when there's this constant movement and lack of decision, lack of loyalty towards God and towards yourself as the one who's carrying them forward, when that happens, it is so difficult, so difficult. There is somewhere... <clears throat> in one of the epistles, a word from, from the apostles that w you should allow your fathers to, to, to pray for you and to work for you and to work for your salvation and allow them to do so with joy because otherwise it's not for your benefit. When you feel that abandonment of your spiritual child on your shoulders, then that gives you the strength, that gives you the power of an actual parent, the instinct of a spiritual father comes to life then and you would do anything and you will do anything for the salvation of your spiritual child. But when the child himself or herself doesn't yet know what they want, they are aware they can't do it on their own because again there are all these spiritual dangers when they abandon you. So they have to be with you. But on the other hand, they still hold on to their own visions, their own understanding, their own predetermined, pre-built idols of what they should be like, what spiritual life should look like, what prayer should look like, of the direction you should take them on to. <clears throat> when you have all of this noise, all of this battle happening here on your shoulders, then it's very probable that you'll fail them because you're not, you don't have the freedom. They don't give you the freedom to simply listen to the voice of Christ in your heart. So you act according to that voice. All the noise that they produce spiritually around you, although you still carry them, all that noise can cover and can make it difficult for them to discern that quiet, salvific voice of Christ. So I've learned a long time ago that when I see my spiritual father, I just throw myself onto his back, spiritually speaking, because otherwise I would kill him. And please don't do that to me because you would kill me as well. But I just give myself to him with that abandonment and that joy that I felt as a kid when my dad was allowing me to, to ride on his back. Because I know he can take me to places where I can't reach by myself. I know he can give me a new beginning. I know he can restart my spiritual engines. And I know this is the only way for me to, to move forward. You know, there's that, there's that story in the life of Christ. We just read it a week or two ago. Um as part of our Sunday Divine Liturgies, when the centurion approaches Christ and asks him to, to heal his servant. And Christ tells him, oh, I will come and I will heal him. And that gives the centurion the opportunity to say those wonderful words. There's no need for you to come because I'm also a man who has others under obedience to me and who is under obedience to others. And if others who are above me, who, under whose authority I, I live, tell me do this or go there, I do it. And if those who are under authority to me, if I tell them do this or go there, they go there and they do it. So then I know that if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And Christ says, I have not seen such faith anywhere, not even in Israel, not even in the chosen nation, the chosen people. But what is extraordinary here is that Christ equals obedience with faith. 
So all the centurion is talking about is obedience. If someone under whose authority I am tells me to do this, I do it. And if someone under whose authority, um, uh, and if someone who lives under my own authority hears from me, do this, they do it. So when the centurion talks to Christ, he only talks about obedience. But what Christ sees and what he responds to is faith. Because he perceives as God that that abandonment of obedience, that complete trust, and again abandonment of one's self to another, that equals faith. And if we learn to do that with our spiritual fathers, then it becomes possible for our hearts to do that with Christ himself. And do not trick yourselves. Do not lie to yourselves. Do not delude yourselves into thinking, oh, I can do this with Christ because he is God, but I cannot do it with a human being because human beings can fail me and abuse me. And yes, that's true. Human beings can fail and abuse you. But God gave you a heart and God gave you a brain, and God gave you eyes for you to see to whom you abandon yourself. You cannot say that you abandon yourself to Christ whom you do not see, but you cannot abandon yourself to your spiritual father whom you can see, who is here. It is a lot easier for someone who's not really obedient to anyone, it is a lot easier to say, I'm obedient to Christ alone. Because Christ is not here to do this to you, metaphorically. To tell you, this is not right, this is wrong. If you want to go to the right, don't say I'm going to the right because God spoke to me. I hear it in my heart that Christ inspires me to go to the right. That's you. That's your will, that's your desire, that's one blind human being leading another blind human being. You need to learn to be obedient like that centurion. You need to learn that we are all connected and that you must be obedient to someone just as others are obedient to you. And you must learn this obedience in relation to another human being before you can even start to attempt, let alone claim, that you are obedient to God. Yes, the one who's carrying you may fall. I may fall as I have someone on my back. I may fall carrying them forward. As we advance through this marsh, this swamp that is life, filled with with sinfulness and dangers. I may not always be able to run. I may not always be able even to walk. I may at times fall down on my knees. I may at times be on my, on my four, my legs and my hands, and I may just be able to, to swim with my head back and my shoulders back, but you're still on my shoulders. And as long as I'm moving forward, you breathe better than I do. If I move forward, I move forward because God sees your obedience, your abandonment to Him through me. And that faith is the same faith that Christ has seen in the centurion. God sees your faith, sees your obedience, and because of you, he helps me to fall less frequently. And because of you, He helps me get up and keep on walking and keep on running sometimes. There is this, I'll say this and then I'll end this because I don't know how I ended up here, but this is what God gave me. But there is this misconception that somehow the one who is being carried has less value than the one who carries him or her. Somehow, um, <laughs> this spiritual relationship of being carried and carrying is translated in our mind as being inferior, like the spiritual child is somehow inferior to his or her spiritual 
uh, further and nothing could be further from the truth I can tell you as someone who is carrying a few people on my shoulders if I stand it's not because I have any virtue it is because you abandon yourself onto these shoulders if I stand and this is the case for any spiritual father out there if we stand if we walk and if we sometimes are even able to run spiritually speaking it's not because of what we do it's not because of what we are deserving it's not because of our virtue it's because our sons and our daughters have truly put their faith in us that we are going to move them forward and take them closer to Christ. And Christ sees that obedience, sees that blessed abandonment, that faith in Him manifesting in obedience to human beings. Christ sees in you the centurion, and because of you, He gives me and all spiritual fathers out there the strength to keep on either walking or crawling forward. You save me. You contribute to my salvation as much as I contribute to your salvation. And in doing that, we are co-saviors of each other. There's no inferiority. There's no level. None of us is higher or lower in the eyes of God. I contribute to your salvation as your spiritual father, by carrying you on my shoulders. You contribute to my salvation as my spiritual children by placing your obedience and your trust and your abandonment onto these poor, weak, sinful shoulders. And Christ sees in that obedience exactly what he's seen in that centurion, faith in him. And he answers the same way, by healing your servant, by healing me, by healing your spiritual fathers wherever you may be and wherever they may be. Because they are your servants. They are the ones carrying you forward. There is no... When my dad carried me on his shoulders as a five-year-old, there was no understanding in his mind that as a human being I was somehow inferior to him. If anything, the joy he gave me only fed his joy. The the laughter and the happiness that he nourished in me only nourished the happiness and the fulfillment he felt as my physical father. Spiritually, things are immensely uncomparably more intense because the relationship, the spiritual relationship between father and son is a lot stronger than the physical relationship between father and son. One is in the flesh and dies with the flesh. The other one is in the spirit and survives our collapse into nothingness, into death and stays in eternity. All of that to say that I am so grateful to every single one of you who during this year and this summer have left a question in our comments or have come here in person and have joined us for one of our summer pilgrimages or are now part of our online community and have asked for our prayers and have asked questions and have... I am so grateful for every single one of you who, even to the smallest degree, found your way on these shoulders. You've almost killed me once again. (laughs) But at the same time, you've given me life. And you've contributed to my salvation. You are so, so generous. So generous. And I don't mean that in in the fact that you support our communities. You support our lives here in the islands. Thank you for that as well. And 
please continue to do that. But you are so generous in saying that we help you when in fact by doing our nothing, our poor <sighs> nothing attempts to help you, you are actually giving life to us. And for that, I am grateful because Christ is uncomparably more present in my life because of everything you place on the shoulders. And this is something any spiritual father, any, would tell you. May God bless every ounce, every pore, every... <laughs> Everything in you, everything that makes you, you, every pore of your being, may Christ bless it to its marrow, beyond hope, beyond expectation, my beloved ones. Amen. Amen. Amen.